Hi everyone, welcome to Systems Medicine. My name is Uri Alon. I'm a pro professor here in Molecular Cell Biology. And I want to welcome you to this uh, journey into the unknown. Uh, you know, I, I want to start right away with our first feedback loop, physiological feedback loop. As human beings, we have different states. And one of them is the, when we're relaxed, the relaxed state. Which is really good for if you want to learn something or remember. Good for memory. Good for a lot of things. To learn, to memory. And we're, when we're in the state, uh, we take nice deep breaths. You know, our body takes deep breaths. But as human beings, we can also uh, decide to take a nice deep breath. Welcome. And when we decide to take a nice deep breath, and we increase the chance that we get into the relaxed state, which is good for learning and listening. There's a couple of empty spaces up here. Up front. And this is empirically proven, right? The, what's called the relaxation response. In, in medicine, there's almost every hospital has mindful, mindfulness-based be relaxation practices that are based on things like that. So in this course, we're going to uh, invite you to take a nice deep sighs of relief once in a while. It sounds like this. <sighs> so let's try it together. Okay, this all together. In order to reach the nice relaxed state of learning, take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> okay. So on the side of the board, I'll be writing what so this says welcome, this says breath, so we know where we are in this hour and a half lecture. I want to talk a little bit about this course. The topic of this course will be, oh, you probably don't want to stand all the lecture, right? So uh, there's a couple of empty places right up front. And uh, <coughs> yeah. And the topic of this course is uh, human physiology and disease uh, studied from uh, principles and mathematical, let's say mathematical principles. And the target, the goal at the end of this uh, course, should you decide to take it, is that you will know uh, principles of why physiological circuits, control circuits, are built the way they are, and why some diseases happen in a conceptual framework that helps to unify a lot of seemingly arbitrary details about human physiology. And also that if you're given a problem in diseases, medicine, you'll be able to write down mathematical models that can generate testable hypotheses at the right level of complexity for the questions you're asking. Did I explain myself? That's the target. Let's see if we can do it. Time. This course will be 12 lectures of an hour and a half with no break, starting at 2.15 here. Every two weeks, uh, we'll have an exercise sheet that should take you a few hours to solve. And, and the grade will be composed of 50% of these exercises and 50% of a final project that you can do in pairs. So that's, oh, I, I've been talking about the time so far, yeah. Now I'm talking about the rules already. <laughs> <laughs> and and <coughs> any, any questions about these, these rules of the course, let's say? And roles, I'll be the teacher. And we have a teaching fellow, Avi Mayo. Could you stand up? Or not stand up, but let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> this is his email. So if you have questions with the exercises or want to connect, uh, that's Avi's email. And so that's, that's the roles. And then, and Avi, and then there's you. What's your role? <laughs> to be yeah, here, open, listen, ask questions, and also a little another kind of role, uh, slightly learn from each other. Because I want to recognize that in this class there's some heterogeneity. For some of you, this equation, dx over dt equals minus x, 
is like uh, bread and butter. Other ones need a little bit of refreshing on these differential equations. Yeah? And for others, glycolysis, the word glycolysis is like breathing. And others uh, need some explanation maybe. What is this word? Okay, so just to understand who, who you guys are, I want to hear from you. And uh, well, I'll do it like this. Turn to someone you don't know yet and figure out what they studied as an undergraduate. Go. somebody that studied something different from them? How many of you found someone that studied something different from them? <laughs> Up to you. Yeah. So it's the majority. That's our challenge, also our strength. So let's hear. What are some, some of you, what, what, what did you study as an undergrad? How many of you studied, so what subjects are here? Physics. Physics. How many physics? I want to know. Okay, so it's about like a third. Who else? What else? Chemistry. Chemistry. So let's see you guys. <laughs> we have a small minority. What else? Wow. Mathematics. Be proud. Okay. What else? Computer science. Computer science. Up, up. Right, it's about 10%. What else? Engineering. Engineering. Huh? Oh, nice. Welcome. What else? Biology. Who else? Huh? Biology. Biology. Up. Okay. That's it. And what, what else? Soil and water science. Soil, soil and water science. <laughs> okay. What else? Any social science? Yeah? Psychology? Psychology? We'll get to some uh, mood disorders in this, in this course too. What else? I mean, we'll, we'll, teach, we'll learn about <laughs> mood disorders. Okay. Uh, all right, I think we kind of, uh, I understand more or less who you are, and my goal is to make it relevant for all of you. Uh, so let's just stop, fi fi finish the spring setting part. We're taking a nice deep side of relief. In this first lecture is kind of an introduction lecture. I'd like in this lecture for you to feel what the course feels like, how we study, and also to uh, start learning about the system that will take us through the first Three lectures, please. It's uh, like the hydrogen atom, you can say, of human physiology. Uh, the glucose insulin circuit. And I'd like to uh, talk, learn with you what is the circuit. And we'll learn the biology of it, do a little mathematical description, simplified description of it, in order to make some uh, points, questions that we'll address in the next two lectures. This circuit is involved in some very common diseases, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, which we will address and understand in lecture 2 and lecture 3. It also deals with basic, basic uh, things that tissues, all tissues basically need to do. So general principles of how tissues work that will be able to generalize to a lot of other tissues and diseases, as you'll see. So glucose insulin circuit. So you know, our cells need energy and food basically to make a carbon source in order to grow and the favorite carbon source in our body is glucose, sugar, sucralanazim, small molecule and uh, the sugar flows in our, you know, when we eat it goes into our bloodstream, flows in our bloodstream and I well, talk about the concentration of glucose in our bloodstream. Concentration of glucose in our bloodstream, virtually everyone in this room is very very similar. The body can keep it within a tight range. The tight range Glucose is kept in a tight range of 5 plus minus 1 millimolar. That's the answer of concentration. Sometimes in medicine it's about 100 
What? Milligrams per deciliter, right? That's what you get from your blood tests. It's another way of saying five millimoles. It's important to keep glucose in this range. If glucose falls below three, uh, you are in trouble. You have too little sugar and you can faint, you can die, hypoglycemia. Uh, your blood can turn acid, all kinds of complications, which are acute, like emergency. If glucose goes too high, it's not a problem unless it lasts for a long time. Too high, like above 10 millimolars. If that lasts for a long time, glucose starts sticking places it shouldn't. It starts causing problems to your blood vessels, your nervous system, blindness, amputation, uh, all kinds of... Th these are the symptoms of type 2 diabetes, ge generally. And these problems are not just in the textbook, they're a huge global problem. Type 2 diabetes is about 10% of the world population, more or less, order of magnitude, and it's growing. We have your Molia Raz, who's an MD, right? You st what's your, your first degree? Medicine? Yeah, so well, all the medicine people, can you raise your hand? You have Molia, and who else? Other doctors? Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> you? Two years, I stopped. Two years and you stopped. So, uh, type two, and type 1 diabetes where the, is also a problem that we'll talk about. That's a 1% more or less of the population. It's a very, very, very common disease. It's a problem with the system. So it's kept in a tight range. If it's too high, it's not good. If it's too low, it's not good. How is it kept in such a tight range, despite the fact that we're so different from each other? Some people even think about like a, just a baby just born, an obese 50-year-old, uh, 80-year-old uh, man, woman. Like, how is it kept in such a tight range? Well, there's a feedback circuit. That's what we're going to study. So we're talking about diabetes. So to understand the, the dynamics of this glucose, I'm going to tell you about how di diabetes is diagnosed. It's called the glucose tolerance test, and which the, the purpose is to understand the dynamics after you, 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 you basically drink some glucose. So you drink 75 grams of glucose, then you measure blood glucose with a blood test uh, at different time points. So typically uh, two hours after. Right? And you can measure in many different time points. So this is time. Here is your glucose level, 5 millimolar. And here T equals 0. You drink the 75 grams of disgusting concentrated glucose. And here is 1 hour. And here is 2 hours. And what happens is that glucose rises. Let's say this is 10 millimolar here. And then it falls and it goes back to baseline. It's supposed to be for virtually all LT people. So as I said, different people not only have the same, more or less the same baseline, the entire dynamics here is stereotyped and very similar between LT people. So we say tight control not only of the steady state, of the entire dynamics. And then it's less, less uh, tight in steady state, but still. If you're, after two hours, your glucose exceeds 11, that's a criteria for uh, diabetes. So people with diabetes with problems in the system, the glucose uh, <coughs> can do weird things. It can go up, then under, undershoot, or go up, 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 and down, down, down very slowly. And that, as I said, over time causes problems because your average glucose level now, averaged over weeks, months, years, is too high. It sticks to places it shouldn't. You have problems with your circulation, with your heart disease, uh, nervous system, eyes. Uh, so this is type 2 diabetes. This is LT range. Any questions? So, no, I'm going, to say, I'm going to pause now until there's a question. <laughs> yeah. What's it called if it dips below the healthy level? Can you ask me that? What, what type of disease is it? What disease is it if it falls below the healthy level? Yeah, okay. And this, this is called hypoglycemia. Hypo means too low. And it could be um, a sign of early insulin resistance. We'll talk about later. You want to add anything? It could be a metabolic disease. A metabolic disease? A section of metabolic disease in which you can... Yeah. 
And that's, of course, dangerous because you don't want glucose to drop very low. Did I answer your question? More or less. Okay. And now let's talk about how these dynamics happen. So Ian yeah, said, glucose tolerance test, I, I, I basically I drag some, if I would draw here the input, the input, the glucose, I gave kind of a pulse of glucose. I dragged 75 grams of glucose, and I get this kind of output. So we want to analyze how you go from this input to this output. Yes, we do. So the way it works is by a physiological famous feedback control circuit. And uh, So glucose <coughs> is removed from the blood by the action of a hormone called insulin. And the idea is this is a little blood vessel, and here's a cell, and here's the glucose in the blood vessel. The blood is flowing that glucose doesn't just enter into the cell, eh, usually. It needs special transporters, glucose transporters. And these glucose transporters are kept in the cell in kind of storage vesicles. In order to go to the membrane, the cell needs a signal or permission. And that permission is a hormone called insulin, <coughs> which is a, a kind of a, a peptide. And the cell has receptors for this insulin. And when insulin binds these receptors, a chain of events happen in the cell that transports those transporters to the membrane. And now glucose can go in. Did I explain myself? Some, some parts of our body, like our brain, which really needs glucose, and it doesn't <coughs> need this insulin, it just eats up the glucose there. It's very important. That's why glucose goes down, we faint. Our brain really needs insulin. It eats a lot of, the, a lot of glucose. It doesn't need insulin. It takes up glucose. But most cells in our body need insulin in order to take up glucose. And the, these receptors mediate that signal. And uh, that's great. Yeah. But we need a way for if the more glucose there is, the more insulin there should be in order to remove the glucose, right? That's a feedback loop in order to keep a, con a control loop. And so otherwise, we add more glucose, it'll just rise and not, not go away. So the way this works is as follows. So we have our input, let's say a meal M, leads right to blood glucose. And this blood glucose is sensed by special cells in the pancreas called beta cells. I'll talk, tell you about them in a second. Which secrete insulin. And insulin removes glucose from the blood. Therefore, the more glucose there is, the more insulin, then the less glucose. That's a negative feedback loop. Unlike our positive feedback loop here, where we can get more and more relaxed. This one <laughs> is a negative feedback loop. Tell you a little bit about these beta cells. These are just like, uh, for those of you who have, haven't learned uh, biology in a while, uh, these are located in a part of our body called the pancreas. It's about the size of a dollar bill here, a gland. And in this gland, it does a lot of other things like bile, acid, secreting bile. But in this gland, there are patches of cells called islets of Langerhans. And if you look at these patches of cells, they contain special cells called beta cells that we'll talk about quite a lot that secrete insulin. And they have another kind of cell called alpha cells that secretes another kind of hormone called glucagon that does the opposite. Instead of removing glucose, it increases glucose. We're going to ignore it in this lecture, but talk about it later. And in fact, I want to say, this lecture, I'm giving you like a basic skeleton of the essentials of the circuit. And I'm going to, for your benefit, ignore a lot of details that 
don't really matter for the principles we're going to discuss, but they are important to know. So you can always open a book on the insulin glucose pathway and read a lot of details. I mean, like PhDs and PhDs of information about this pathway. <coughs> Give you the essentials here. And these beta cells <coughs> sense glucose, secrete insulin, lowers glucose, negative feedback. So, where are we? Insulin, beta cells, pancreas. Okay, we're here. Now, those of you that um, studied about the circuit in the past, could you raise your hand? Hi, hi. And those of you that haven't, take a look. Take a look who's raising his hand. Because what I want you to do now is to pair up. Those of you who haven't studied this, find a partner who did and ask them some questions about this, this biology. But I guarantee you there's a lot of questions that you're interested in. So please turn to someone like that and ask them some questions about this surgery. How it works? What's going on <laughs> cells and takes up glucose that way. The liver can store glucose in these glycogen molecules and release it when needed, like you say. And also, uh, people with diabetes sometimes they have uh, excessive drinking water and urinating because the body tries to get rid of the glucose by that, that way, and if you get dehydrated that way. So, uh, and at least, and the brain keeps eating glucose all the time. Um, other questions? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I asked if there is some saturation level of glucose in the cells. It's dangerous if we uh, produce too much insulin and there's too much glucose in the cells. Right. So the question is, is there a danger if there's too much insulin, the, cell, the major cells become too full of glucose and that can hurt them? Yeah. And as far as I know, the, the cells that are most sensitive to too much glucose are the beta cells that sense glucose and they can die from what's called glucotoxicity. And that's amazing. It looks like an accident, because that's very dangerous, causes diabetes, as we'll say, but it will turn out to be actually a design principle, not by chance, as far as we can tell. Did I answer your question? Yeah. But All the authors are fine with... What do you think, Amalia? I think it's toxic to other tissues. Yeah? Too much glucose is toxic to more tissues. 
So maybe it's fine to say as a teacher, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what other questions? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, is uh, you know the rate of uh, uh, um, securing uh, like secreting the insulin uh, from the cells uh, continuously growing as uh, the glucose uh, yeah. grows, or is there a threshold that it needs to? So this rate of secretion of insulin. This is getting to the mathematical equations we're right next. We need to know what it is. Rate of secretion of insulin is a function of glucose. So this will be some. Uh, f of g, an increasing function, and um, the best measurements I know of are that it rises approximately like glucose squared, and uh, it starts rising right around that 5 millimolar threshold. But that's definitely a topic that needs more investigation. Yeah. How about other animals? Is there a similar circuit? Is uh. it still 5 millimolars? So other animals, yeah, th this uh, circuit is very conserved in vertebrates and um, insulin and beta cells and glucose, etc. And concentration, I don't know about concentra blood concentration. Does anybody know? You don't know. Um, even in animals like uh, bats and, and, and hummingbirds that eat basically glucose, they eat fruit all the time. They, don't, they never get diabetes. They're very, very good at this. And other animals like uh, Samona Midbal, Samona Sobesus that eats these very uh, special plants, not a lot of glucose. If you put them on regular food for laboratory mice, they get obese and diabetes very quickly. So there's some animals can deal with excess glucose is better than others. There's evolutionary adaptations. Did I answer your question? No. Right. We're going to continue unless there's a burning question. Looking around, it's the time to ask. Okay, in order to prepare for the math, I prepared a song for you <laughs> before we go into the math. This song was written by a Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Bob Dylan. <laughs> How many of you know about Bob Dylan songs? Don't have to be <laughs> well, it's adapted for this. <laughs> Early one morning, the sun was shining, and I was sleeping in, wondering if my beta cells still secreting insulin. What well, with type 1 diabetes and type 2 on the rise? Now in the 21st century, you never can tell. Well, I was standing on the side of the road, rain falling down on my shoes, heading, heading out for the clinic. Lord knows I paid my dues getting through. Tangled up in glue coals. Yeah, she was married when we first met, soon to be divorced. Helped her out of a jam, I guess, but I used a little too much force. We both had type 1 diabetes with an insulin syringe. We split up on a sad dark night after an eating binge. And I, will, <laughs> I looked at her and she was going away and I, my world began to fade. I heard her say over my shoulder, we'll meet again someday on the avenue. Tangled up in glucose. That's enough of that. <laughs> so let's get tangled up in some differential equations. Now the purpose of this is in order to try to go beyond this description towards understanding whether our biological understanding is enough to understand these clinical phenomena. And as you'll see, um, no. What I told you so far can't explain certain really important things. Like for example, um, people with obesity uh, their insulin doesn't work so well. The receptors don't respond to insulin. That's called insulin resistance. But most of them, like beyond 80%, don't have any problem with their glucose. So, like they don't have diabetes. Their, their, their dynamics are insensitive to a key parameter in the equations. And it's just really interesting to understand why that is. <coughs> and also uh, and how when we grow from a baby to an adult, uh, this thing stays so constant despite huge changes in our blood volume. 
and our everything about our body. So, so that's the purpose of the Matamal model I'll tell you about now, to see what we understand and what we don't, and then we'll fill in the gaps in the next lecture, see what we need to add. Did I explain myself? So if this is going to be confusing, um, and then it's done for a purpose, not, not to confuse you. <coughs> and that's up to you to ask me questions, so I can see if I'm clear. Yeah. All right, so I need a place to write <coughs> these equations. So I'm going to use the space here. And I'm working by what's called the minimal model for this system, proposed by Bergman, Richard Bergman, in 1979. And it's an actually really useful to analyze clinical data. It's the basis for measuring insulin resistance and a lot of the, uh, and understanding glucose tolerance tests, basically. Uh, used, used millions of times every year into across the world, and so it's, it's, it's an important model. So what's a model for the system? So glucose is, you know, the concentration of blood glucose is an important variable here right? so we want to control. So we need to write the balance of glucose as it's supplied, let's say, by food and removed by insulin. And the tool for that is differential equation. Differential equation talks about the rate of change of glucose. Rate of change. DGDT. And what is this rate of change? So there's a supply. The supply, we're going to call it M, like meal. And supply comes from two things. When we're, when we're not eating, like when we're sleeping, our glucose releases the stores and supplies our liver. Releases the stores and supplies glucose. That's why we don't faint. We're okay if we don't eat. Even though eating is good for emotional eating, right? Emotional regulation. We're still okay if we don't eat. Let's remind myself. <laughs> so, you know, that's a supply, M. So, all right. And then glucose is also removed. And removal in all these biological equations when I'm going to write always looks like this. This is the removal rate which is like probability per unit time for glucose to be taken up by some cell or removed from the blood. So this has units of one over time. And this is glucose concentration. So each molecule of glucose has some rate per unit time to be removed. Oh, we have some new people. I want to introduce you to another custom we have in this course. So you're welcome. As you walk in, when people are going to come in late, we're going to take a nice deep sigh of relief in their honor. Right, so let's take a nice deep sigh of relief in your honor. Uh, so this acknowledge you, it's fine, you take your place, and we can continue. And you know, what is this removal rate in our system? What, do, what does the removal? It's insulin that instructs the cells to take up glucose. Right, so our removal rate, <coughs> we're going to model it as follows, and that's very good agreement with experiments, is insulin times some constant, which is the rate at which glucose is removed per unit of insulin. And this thing here is going to be very important. This parameter is here is called insulin sensitivity. So insulin sensitivity is basically how much this receptor system responds to insulin and tells the cells to take up glucose. And this insulin sensitivity parameter it's famous. Maybe some of you have heard of the term insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is, a, is one over insulin sensitivity. So insulin. And the reason this parameter exists is that it's actually a very useful parameter. It's the body's way to allocate resources. For example, if we exercise, our cells need glucose, need sugar, energy. That increases this S. <coughs> exercise reduces insulin resistance. That's why it's so great to exercise if you have diabetes, etc. It's great to exercise in general. Exercise insulin sensitivity parameter S 
it goes up, it goes up with exercise. It also, um, so each unit of insulin is more effective at removing glucose. You understand what I'm saying? That's for exercise. But on the other hand, um, if you are, let's say, have an infection, our immune system needs a lot of energy. And our immune system is primarily in the blood. So what happens in infection is that you get insulin resistance. Or otherwise, insulin is less effective in removing glucose. There's more glucose in the blood. Infection, insulin resistance. Also pregnancy. And then C, where you basically devote your sugar not to the mom, to the baby. So the mom gets insulin resistance. And that, that could become uh, pregnancy-related diabetes, as we'll discuss. So this is a way for the body to control, um, to control resource allocation. It's a very <coughs> good physiological adaptation. And uh, what else can cause insulin resistance? Trauma. Huh? Trauma. Trauma? Like stress, chronic stress. Chronic stress. Is that right? Yeah, chronic stress, insulin resistance. And also obesity. Obesity, without exception, causes insulin resistance. That, why is that? This is very complicated. But among other things, obesity causes chronic inf uh, inflammation. You can say like infection, inflammation. And so this parameter can vary by about 10 between people and between conditions of the same. And so that's what I mean. How amazing it is that it was 5 millimolar despite tenfold variation in an important parameter like that. Yeah, so that's something we need to understand. Yeah? How about the supply M? Yeah. It's not a constant. Good, so supply M, let's talk about that. So you say the supply M is not a constant. Right. Yeah, say more. Uh, it varies with time. It varies with time. For example, <coughs> three times a day or four times, five times a week, something, ten times. Mm -hmm. Snacks. So we have these rises in M. And what we eat is very complicated. It goes through our gut, the microbiome, etc. We get some amount of glucose and also amino acids, lipids, etc. They also affect the system in ways that uh, I'm not going to discuss, but they also affect how insulin and all this stuff. So this M is a, is a, is a increase, it goes up. And when we're not eating, M is supplied by, it's a liver, releases glucose into the blood. And that's also the process that insulin affects. Did I answer your question? Yeah. What about the age? Age. Age um, is, we're going to discuss, age is a big risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Whereas type 1 diabetes happens when you're young, sometimes also when you're old. In relation to S. And I would say that age goes with insulin resistance because of chronic inflammation and increasing cortisol and at least. Do you agree? Yeah. It's so nice to have you, Moria, <laughs> <laughs> with your medical knowledge. Um, I studied physics, but I didn't say. I said physics, first degree, second degree, third degree. Then I went to biology, systems biology. You can see the previous course, physics of behavior, where we talked about circuits inside the cell, online. There's videos like this. So fake. What's your name, by the way? Who's here? Uzi El is photo photoing us. So it's nice that you're here. I see you're following me. And so this is another thing I should say is the videos will be online for you to, to watch too. And, and also we'll try to get um, lecture notes online on our website. So even if you're not in Weissman, you can, you can log in. You freely get the lecture notes. The exercises eventually solutions. That's at least our aim. And, all right, so we talk about this important parameter here. The removal rate changes uh, for a factor of 10 between different people. So we already see how challenging it's going to be to have dynamics that don't depend on this parameter. It's like Okay, and we we'll move now to the second equation, which is for insulin. So we have half of it is glucose. Now we want to see how insulin changes. And why does it change? Because beta cells <coughs> can tell there's glucose and they make more insulin. Right, so we want to see how beta cells produce insulin. And then we want to see, uh, also insulin is a molecule that gets itself removed from the blood. It gets degraded, it gets endocytosed by cells. 
So it also has supply and removal. So this is going to be insulin here, rate of change of insulin, rate of change of insulin. So I want to model what happens in the beta cell here when it gets glucose. And beta cell it takes up glucose. It, it actually, the way it senses it is very interesting. It breaks it down by glycolysis, which is a process of breaking down glucose into carbon and energy. That changes its ATP to ADP ratio. That kind of goes like ATP to ampere. That goes like glucose squared, more or less. And that causes, after a chain of events, release of insulin stored in vesicles. It pumps it out. So these are insulin-making machines. They're pumping out insulin. And the more glucose, the more insulin. So how we model that, so we have, the, we have our beta cell here. And it's making X molecules of insulin per hour. And these are diluted through the entire blood volume. So if we want to get concentrations of insulin, <coughs> I put here the blood volume, which is about five liters in, a, in, a, in me. But when I was a baby, it was maybe half a liter or something. Right? So it changed by a factor of 10 as I grew or less, maybe factor. 27 from 3 kilos to 81, let's say it's 27, right? So uh, we have to put in the blood volume here. And already you see that this is going to change as, as, as the blood volume grows. So we need to keep this 5 millimolar constant as a person grows 27 times in their blood volume. Or pregnancy is 50% increase in blood volume. But the glucose is 5 millimolar unless you have a problem. So, so how does that work, right? I'm trying to uh, explain. <laughs> Uh, to, to make clear <coughs> what glands in our body that communicate with distant glands. So insulin is not the only hormone. We already mentioned glucagon, but there's dozens of hormones where one gland needs to talk with the rest of the body, or specifically. It needs to communicate with a distant gland, distant gland, but you don't know what the blood volume is that you're diluting into. You don't know what the sensitivity parameter of that distant gland is. You don't know, but you still need to make things extremely precise. Glucose is not the only precise thing in the body. Uh, again, hundreds of variables that need to be kept precisely, like free calcium ions need to be around 10% around one millimolar concentration, and magnesium, sodium, potassium, blah, 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 blah. So uh, all of these require circuits. And these circuits, of course, also need to take into account each other. <coughs> we need to understand principles. So what I'll tell you about this circuit will teach us principles next lecture that apply to many, many circuits. And that allows us to abstract on a lot of systems and diseases at once, as you'll see. There was a question. Yeah. First of all, uh, GNI, uh, uh, um, this is not the amount in the whole body. So is it the amount of Can you say again, please? GNI, uh, the amount in, in one Oh, in so you're asking, what does these variables GNI stand for? Yeah. So G is, G, I should have said, it's concentration of blood glucose. So it's take all the glucose in all the five liters of blood, take how many moles there is, divide by how many liters, you get five millimolars. Okay, and, and insulin is the same, it's concentration. And second and the second one, so the tight range we need to, um, to keep is, is the percentage of in, of, of in blood? Yeah, concentration. Concentration is percentage. Yeah, all in concentration. All, all in concentration is. Five, when I say millimolar, one molar is one Avogadro's number of molecules in a liter. Yeah, but if we have more blood, I don't know. Yeah, so great. So you're pregnancy, 50% more blood, you still need five millimolar, which means you need more molecules in the larger volume. Did I explain myself? Yeah. I really appreciate this question and all the questions so far. Because I guarantee you, if somebody's asking, somebody else has the same question. So um, let's honor this question by a nice deep sigh of relief, actually. <laughs> Uh, you keep asking me, so I can, I don't really, it's my job to be clear, understandable. Okay, so what's this equation here? So, and then we said that there's this function where glucose increases, the beta cells do glycolysis, they measure glucose. So this function, as I said, to some approximation, is something like this. It's, it goes like glucose squared, and in order to get units right, there's a halfway point, like a, uh, unit of concentration where, where this becomes effective. It's not really important for us right now. But all this number, all this number, x divided by volume divided by k squared, we're going to call this q. This is something like the concentration of insulin that a beta cell can secrete uh, 
that's so if the beta cell is sick or dying or that, this Q will be smaller. Or if blood volume grows, this Q will be smaller. Because you need to dilute more into the blood volume. So this, this is this number. And I multiply here by B, which is number of beta cells. So this is per cell, number of beta cells. And here I put this G squared, because I want to, this thing to grow with glucose. So that's the production term. Did I explain myself? Yeah. G is already uh, incorporated into Q. Q yeah. yeah, right. So I want to take, I want to leave G out. I want to take uh, Q will have all of this. So thanks. I wasn't clear. It has everything but the G square. Oh, right. yeah, so this this part is not important. I just wanted to try to show you where Q comes from. It's just important to know that when blood volume grows, Q goes down because you need to dilute more. If cells are sick, they can make X small, <coughs> that Q goes down. So again, it's something that can change. It does change, not can change. It does change dramatically over the lifespan. And with your physiological state and metabolism, it's just another variable that changes. And then, any more question? So again, what is the G squared divided uh, by Q? No. G What does it stand for? This stands for. So this is f of g. This is now a, an empirical, like an experimental finding <coughs> that the amount of insulin secreted by a beta cell goes up with glucose. And if you plot that graph, um, this is how much glucose, this is our beta cell. It's secreting insulin. And this is this insulin secretion. That this thing goes like this, more or less, like like g squared, g over k squared. And k is, is a number that gives the right units. Uh, can I ask why it's not linear? Why it's not linear? Yeah, great question. So <coughs> maybe simplest design would have been to make it a linear proportional. Uh, what could be advantages for making it what's called cooperative or nonlinear or accelerating? And so we'll see soon that that, that actually going to make our dependence on parameters a little bit tighter and better. So that's, we're going to see it in a second. We're going to solve these uh, the steady state. The more, more cooperative it is, the less the dependence on parameters. And also it's like saying, if glucose is really, really getting high, it work ri much harder. So you work harder. Your, the effort you make in making insulin accelerates with glucose, not just right proportionally, but even more. So it's like an emergency if there's high glucose. You can think of it like that. Maybe you can think of the price of having a oh. really high glucose is higher. So Itai is saying maybe the price of the body of having high glucose grows with glucose even more than linearly or something. But it makes those cells work very hard because to produce insulin, they're slave to producing their own body weight of insulin every day. And it's very hard. Yeah. So this obviously can only hold within the very small parameter range that the glucose can exist, right? Because going forward is not physical. Yeah. So what the, the cool thing is, everything that arises like this can't go to infinity. There has to be some cut, some range where, is this what you mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and energy grows only with G, right? Because yeah. So, so at some point, it's going to saturate at some point this has to saturate. And a, a, better, a better functional description that's used a lot of time in biology is g squared divided by k squared plus g squared, which looks like g squared over k squared when g is small, but goes but hits one when g is large. And that's a good that, that's a function that crops up many times in physiology called the Hill function. And those of you that took the previous course, you can derive this function from some basic assumptions about uh, biology. But we're going to use this G-squared for our, our range, our relevant range, which is 5 millimolar, 10 millimolar, 20 millimolar, 2 millimolar, this range. And as you'll see, it's going to end up also not being very important for the questions we'll ask. More questions? That's great. So we're like really interrogating this circuit, right? When we write equations, we need to think at an additional level about what's going on, beyond the cartoon, which is uh, what you find in typical medical books and biology books.
I'm not devaluing because you can get a lot from this, but we want to make an extra step. That's why I say if you don't know differential equations, it's worth uh, learning them. And if you do know, tolerate what I'm doing and we'll get to more stuff you know less later. All right, now we want to talk, so this is the production of insulin, and now we want to talk about removal. And removal is going to be, again, this is going to be just the rate of removal, which is the probability per unit time that an insulin vanishes from the system. And I would just want to say that the lifetime of insulin is about 30 minutes. This is going to be 1 over 30 minutes, or 1 over half an hour. So I mean, that's a typical rate. Why should insulin removal cause it to be removed? Why does, why, ah, yes, why does insulin cause it to be removed? So I want to explain this term. The way to interpret this, ter this term is not that insulin causes itself to be removed, but any, it's like radioactive decay or any uh, equation that talks about a biological molecule that has a certain rate per unit time to be removed. The rate of change in concentration is the concentration times this rate. So you have, so if you have, if you have uh, twice the amount of insulin, more will be removed in the unit time than if you have half of that amount. So that the amount removed is proportional to insulin because each molecule has a certain rate per unit time of being removed. Did I explain? Okay, we have our equations. Let's take a nice deep breath. Uh, I'm perspiring. Okay. Uh, another question? Yeah. Uh, what about consumption of G? Insulin doesn't consume G? By the way, we're doing really well on time. So we can be happy about that. Can you ask me again? Yeah. Uh, insulin and the consumption of G. Right? This thing. No, no, in the equations. This thing. Yeah, so if uh, we consume more G, the insulin doesn't decrease. Also? Great, so great, great question. So suppose now we, uh, we get rid of some G. What will happen? Well, insulin production, which depends on G squared, will go down. Hmm. So if, we if we, there's less G, insulin production will go down and insulin will go down because it's removed. Did I answer your question? So that, that's how these two equations work together. And all right, now what I want from these equations, why do we write these, these equations? We want to ask questions like this. We want to ask questions about, about this steady state level, five millimole. Is it plausible that different people with a tenfold difference in insulin resistance, and who knows how much difference in Q, blood volume, and stuff like that, is it plausible that we'll all have five millimolar glucose, plus minus one? So in order to ask that, solve that, we need to ask about the steady state of these equations. So now I'm talking about at night. You're not eating. The liver is producing glucose. Insulin is produced at some basal level. And we come to the hospital, let's say, or to the clinic to get a blood test. We haven't eaten for eight hours, right? This is like our fasting level. We're supposed to have five millimolar. So that's what's called steady state level. So we need to calculate the steady state of these equations. So let's do that. So how do you calculate the steady state? Hmm? Again? Somebody said something? Did somebody say something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the comment is, in order to calculate steady states, we need to equate the rate of change of glucose to zero and the rate of change of insulin to zero. That means no change. That's steady state. So this is, we need to calculate dg dt equals zero and di dt equals zero, which means no change. So we're asking what is going up, how, what does the equation tell us when we're at steady state? Everything is balanced out and there's no change anymore. So we need to solve. And it's not, not that difficult. So, <coughs> so the GDT equals zero. <coughs> the GDT equals zero. And so what does that mean? So that means that M minus SIG, so I put here at the removal rate is S times I equals zero. So G steady state is M steady state divided by S I steady state. And this insulin sensitivity parameter is what uh, defines this person at this particular moment. 
M steady state is the steady state production of glucose. ST is steady state, right? And this G steady state. What about I steady state? So we do the I dt equals zero. So that means that Q B G steady state squared minus gamma I steady state equals zero. The solution for that is the G steady state squared equals gamma I steady state divided by QB. All right. Um, so now I just want to solve for G, uh, G squared steady state. So what I'm going to do is just rewrite this thing. I'm going to say I steady state is M steady state divided by S G steady state. Right? So I put, move this here, I move this here. And now that I have I steady state, I can plug this into this equation and get gamma M steady state. Now I'm not doing I'm doing this for a purpose, right? So we can understand <coughs> the plausibility of this five mole. model. And now notice that I have G steady state down here, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. move it here, multiply by G steady state, and my answer is the G steady state to the third power equals gamma M steady state divided by S cube, and I forgot the B here. And just to finish it off, I'm going to take the third root. So I have just G steady state here, and here I have the third root. And that's going to be our answer for, <coughs> let's talk about this for a second. What this means, and this third root, by the way, is because, because of your questions, because of this square. If it was to the fourth power, it would have been the fifth root, which is even more uh, powerful. And so let's, let's take a look at this thing. What can we learn from this equation? It means that, suppose now that I take the person and I give that person insulin resistance. Let's imagine, okay, imagine that uh, the person has insulin resistance. What does that mean? I'm going to take their S and I'm going to reduce it by 8. Now we have insulin resistance. That means this thing down here gets smaller by 1 8. Okay. So our G steady state goes to G steady state divided by 1 8 to the power of one third. So what I did here is I reduced this parameter by eight. So the change in this thing is one eighth, a cubed root of one eighth. Now, you know that eight is two times two times two. So the cube root of eight is two. That means that this thing here is G steady state divided by one half, or two G steady state. So if I give that person a reasonable insulin resistance, instead of five millimolar, this equation tell us so I have 10 millimoles, mil twice, <coughs> twice the glucose. The other parameters stay Yeah, suppose I, I stay all the parameters constant. And now, I, there are even drugs that give you insulin resistance. Everything else still is constant, I just change this S parameter. Why, why aren't they dependent on S? The question is, why are these parameters not dependent on S? And in order to, a, make the circuit work, you have to make them dependent on S somehow. Because this is just not working. This, uh, this is contrary to the observation that people with diabetes, most of them have five millimolar glucose. Did I explain myself? So this, uh, this picture uh, needs additional thinking in order to understand how a gland like that can work despite variations parameters. Or Q, right? Blood volume now, if I grow, okay, I grow. So I, I was born, let's say, three <coughs> kilos. And I became an adult, let's say, weigh 81 kilos. That's 27 times more. Okay, so Q drops by factor 27, because so insulin is diluted into 27 times more blood. Blood is approximately linear with mass, blood volume. So a uh, cube root of 27 
27 is 3 times 3 times 3. Cube root of 27 is 3. Right? So I should have had 15 millimolar, millimolar glucose. Not 5, but 15. If, if as a baby I had 5, I should have 15, right? But I don't. I have, I have 5. So uh, blood volume changes. Insulin resistance changes. Other things change. But something keeps uh, the, the system at 5. Yeah? But it doesn't mean that yeah, your body is changing. So the beta cells are changing to the bigger, the, the more of them. So Superb. So the, the comment here is the body does things to compensate, right? Yeah. For example, as I grow, I have more, the pancreas grows bigger, beta cells bigger. Right. So in order to keep 5 millimolar, it needs to grow somehow in the right, the right amount. So that's one principle we need to grow. And indeed, our organs grow in proportion. But each organ has its own control of growth that we'll discuss next time. Thanks. Absolutely. So there's extra feedbacks here that are really interesting. We're going to discuss next time. Another comment is, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to do something. I want to uh, propose another um, parent share like we did before, where I want to ask you to turn to the person that you talked to before about the biology. And now, ask questions about the math part, everything I did here. Okay, so we spend a couple of minutes of doing that, just to make sure you're clear at all this maneuver. Where does cubed root come from and everything? So, enjoy. <laughs> also our system. So it will be very interesting to compare what happens in the neural system and in this uh, hormone system. Maybe we can learn from each other. So any questions about the math so I just don't gloss over it? Yeah. I don't know if it's the math, but uh, I, mean, um, I just, I didn't understand why we're supposed to be surprised or what does it tell us that uh, the behavior of S, but I don't know anything about the units. I don't know anything about the sensitivity to what units it is taken. I mean, I can take it as a unit that would be squared, I can take it as a unit that would be cubed. I mean, I can play with the power. I see. So your question asking is, do, what are the units of insulin sensitivity I mean, that... You, you were surprised, yeah. but I mean, oh, oh, not surprised, but we got something. So yeah. I don't know what the result means that okay. SPA is. Yeah, so maybe you talk a little bit more about insulin sensitivity. Insulin sensitivity uh, is well defined, it can be measured, and, and that's one of the uses of this Birkman model. But for example, if you inject some insulin, and you f see how quickly glucose is removed. Then you get this S. Basically, whole body or yeah, whole, whole blood. So this is like how much a unit of insulin increases the removal rate of glucose. You and you can measure that. So, and then you can talk okay, about tenfold changes. Et Did I explain myself? Yeah. That's one of the uses of the Bergman model. Also. And are you, any more questions? So this side, for example. Yeah. You said that obese people have different sensitivities, but still the same glucose. So that I didn't I need to understand that part. Of that. Oh, yeah. The obese people have different sensitivities measured, but they still have the same glucose steady state. 
Great. So uh, what, I, what the question is, uh, if you, to repeat what I said before, so uh, people with obesity uh, universally have uh, insulin resistance. It means this parameter S is, is low. And a unit of insulin works less well at removing glucose from the blood. It, it could be 10 times less. And at that hand, you look at their glucose, not only the state state, the entire <coughs> dynamics, and in most of them, it looks like, like uh, people without insulin resistance. Uh, I just talk about the dynamics. This equations, um, this S changes the time constant of this equation. And it's extremely unusual that a model doesn't change its dynamics when you change S by a factor of 10. Usually you go to something like this, but not, not in the physiological system. So we need to understand how the system compensates for changing the parameters, S, Q, and supply from the liver, removal rate of insulin, everything. Yeah. And more questions. Yeah. So if you show the, you show the problem of this, but what's the merit of these equations? Like, why are they so important? Why are they so important? Yeah. So these equations. Um, they show a blood. Right. right. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Why? Uh, why are these equations so important? And so, if we like, you go to do an exercise, take these equations and put them on a computer, and give them a meal. M, is, I'm going to plot a second. They give you an output that looks um, similar to what you measure in the glucose tolerance test. Right, so if I give a meal input, so this is time, and M goes like this. Right, this is our meal input on the computer. We're now simulating the equation. M, I'm going to write here MT, the supply rises. Then what happens is that glucose, which is, starts at 5 millimolar, what happens to it here? Because of this equation, supply is higher. So its rate of production increases. So it starts going up. And we're drawing here insulin. It starts at insulin steady state. And at this time, because glucose is going up, insulin is also going up because of this production term. What happens when insulin goes up? When insulin goes up, more removal of glucose. So glucose stop, stops going up so quickly. And when the meal drops, it just, it's removed. It goes back. Because there's no production anymore, it's removed. It goes back to, state, to baseline. And because glucose goes down, insulin goes down to baseline. And you get something that looks like this. And from that, you can calibrate parameters. And you can, uh, as I said, have a, a theory that guides you to understand, oh, this S is an important parameter, and it's important to measure. And it is important to measure. It's one of the things you measure when you want to understand a person's uh, medical condition, and especially if you have serious problems with diabetes. And so, and so that guided what measurements uh, doctors ended up making, which are predictive and important for clinical assessment. So that's, uh, that's the importance of this model. Did they explain? And it's the simplest model. And it's also called the minimal model because it's, it's very uh, simple. I would say uh, that uh, unlike neurons, neuron systems, in the wor world of endocrine systems, there's more of a chance that uh, the number of variables is, is limited. You don't need like neurons, you have a firing rate and many other things. Here, concentrations are fine, even though some hormones have pulses. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's also a minimal model, and so we can deal with it in the classroom. Yeah. Yes? Um, so, the rate of supply, yeah. um, are, there, are there multiple sources of, uh, of glucose in the body, and if so, uh, are they different from person to person? So the question is, what about the supply in the body? So of course there's a supply from uh, food, which is, and that, that is different from person to person because of our makeup and gut bacteria, etc. 
And then in the body, there's a, the main supply comes from the liver, this kind of metabolic barrel, triangular shape, that gets the blood from the intestinal, gets all the intestinal blood, and works on it, and supplies the rest of the body. And one of the things it has is it, it, it takes up glucose when there's too much glucose and makes this polymer called glycogen, which is a store. And then when, they're, when you're sleeping, it breaks it back into glucose. So that's a constant supply. And that supplies your brain, etc., when you're fasting. And it can also take up proteins from uh, muscles, basically, and turn them into glucose in a process called gluconeogenesis. That's another thing that the liver does. And what else? Those are, I think, the main supplies I know of glucose. Then there's other things. There's fat, fats, lipids, uh, triglycerides, uh, amino acids you get from the food, which also beta cells integrate over them in some complicated way, and hormones from the intestine that says, look out, food is coming, and they make beta cells secrete more insulin. Even, so there's even insulin secretion before you eat. Before the, the, so there's a little bit of feed forward control. Your brain also has neurons go there. So there's some preempting. So there's like a sophisticated. I'll tell you where my question is coming from. Right. Okay, yeah. so uh, when you try to control a system you, uh, with a particular response uh, rate, you need to balance the rate of production of the thing that you're making, right? And the rate with which you're able to, to detect you know, so anything's changing, right? Yeah. So you don't overshoot your set clock. Right. So I'm wondering, kind of, given that there may be different many sources of, of glucose, do they have different <coughs> time constants associated with them? And how does that compare to time constant for the sensing? Yeah. The, the so this question comes from a engineering control perspective, you yeah. could say? Yeah. yeah. So in engineering control, suppose I want to control temperature in this room. Uh, we have a heater or a air conditioning, air conditioner measures the temperature, compares to a set point, changes the power to the air conditioning, and doesn't give up until the temperature goes to the set point, right? We'll see something like that in the next lecture, but this five millimolar. And there, you have a lot of theory. If you know how quickly the air conditioner works or how quickly temperature is changing when you open the window, you can optimize the controller to get quickly to the desired temperature without overshooting, undershooting. We don't want to get hypoglycemia. We don't and so it's a question about optimal control and uh, properties. And indeed, there is theoretical work on understanding the control here as an optimal control, including a bang-bang control, things like that. And the time scales are relevant, but it's beyond our, our level now. But I can refer you to some lecture. Right. OK, look, it's, we're going to finish ahead of time. So you get the gift of 15 minutes of free time to do whatever you want. Um, it's been very enjoyable to meet you. Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about um, how this works, this type control, and see that the price you pay for this type control is an inherent fragility that leads to type 2 diabetes. So we're going to connect an essential circuit in order for uh, home control to work in the body, essential, and see that it has an inherent fragility, you can't escape, that in order to address this fragility, you, this fragility, you are prone to diseases like type, type 2 diabetes, where type 2 diabetes, you basically, you don't make enough insulin, and in the end, beta cells die, collapse, and not enough, no insulin, glucose goes higher, less beta cells, like all these troubles. And in the third lecture, We'll see how, in order to address this, you also create a vulnerability to type 1 diabetes, which is even more mysterious. It's when young people, typically, their own immune system attacks beta cells and kills beta cells. So it's like their body attacking their own beta cells. They attack the beta cells, but not the alpha cells. So they attack some things and not other things. It happens about 1% of the people. So we'll try to understand, based on the general principles, why that happens. Why is there autoimmune disease? And why some organs are attacked and some are not? So that'll be like a three lecture series, but today we built the basis of understanding the physiology of the glucose insulin circuit, the so first approximation, and the beginnings of two of the three equations that we'll use to understand it.
to explain ourselves where we're going. All right. Let's take a nice uh, deep sigh of relief. Uh, see you next Monday.